thank you so much to Tom and to Will for the invitation to be amongst such extraordinary um, people today. Um, and a special thank you to Rick for providing some really interesting context for the talk that I'm going to give you today, which is called Seeing in the Dark. Rick spoke this morning about how what we really have to fear, um, if it's anything, is, is the dark, the, um, the unknown unknowns, as the great philosopher Donald Rumsfeld would, would call them. Um, <laughs> And so, so that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about the landscape in which you're all doing business. Um, a landscape that's been fundamentally altered in recent times by Edward Snowden's revelations. Um, it's a landscape that's become increasingly technologized. And I want to talk to you about some unlikely guides um, that might help us situate ourselves in this newly technologized landscape artists. Um, so I guess let's just start a bit about me so you kind of have an understanding about where I'm coming from. As Tom says, I'm the artistic director of Lighthouse um, based here in Brighton. We're a digital culture agency and we work with artists, filmmakers, designers, technologists um, and we make exhibitions, productions and events that really try and make the point that digital culture is about more than just tools and technology. It's about emotion, aesthetics, and learning. We're interested in trying to perceive the societal transformations which are being brought about by technology. I also write a blog which looks at research from the fields of um, physics and astronomy. And I mention all of this to really try and drive home that I'm interested in the point where art and technology meet. Because I think it's in this confluence that we start to see new ways of doing business. We start to see new creative ideas emerge. I'm fascinated in what happens when artists, filmmakers, and other creative people are thinking just as hard about technology and science as the scientists and engineers are. And that informs the way that I perceive what I call the post-prism landscape that we now find ourselves doing business within. Edward Snowden's revelations about the widespread use of surveillance and monitoring have changed the way that many of us think about technology. And he certainly changed the way that many of us think about the large businesses which are doing business with our data. In the post-prism environment, the existence of drones, data centers, mass mechanized surveillance, and secret rendition programs are all revealed. So entrepreneurs and business leaders like many of you here today who want to operate ethically need to think carefully about how to act within this post-prism landscape. And as it happens, artists working with technology and technologists working creatively are some of the best guides we have to this post-prism landscape. And that's because they've been actively surveying this terrain and mapping this landscape for years now. They've been revealing aspects of its top topology that many of us chose to ignore until the Edward Snowden revelations came along. And more importantly than that, Artists and creative technologists have designed tools and maps to help us navigate this new landscape. So before we look at some of these pre-Snowden artistic whistleblowers and their creation, let's take a closer look at this new technological landscape and its characteristics. The more heavily encoded our world becomes, the harder it is to read. Our technologized world is becoming opaque. Pervasive automated machine surveillance gives us the impression that machines are watching over our every move. Algorithms are loose within the stock market, automatically carrying out trades. Entire cities are being planned for the exclusive use of machines. As technology becomes more ubiquitous, our relationship with our devices becomes ever more seamless, and our technical infrastructure is disappearing from view. We now refer to the 
vast server banks which store our personal data as the cloud. And this really implies a desolidification of infrastructure, which as we can see here, is very much bricks and mortar. So pervasive has this metaphor of the cloud become that a recent survey revealed that over half of all Americans think that bad weather <laughs> affects cloud computing. <laughs> Extraordinary, huh? Um, in reality, actually, if you're looking for where the internet really is, you'd be better off looking here, under the sea, because our digital world is enabled by thousands of miles of submarine cables, that quintessentially 19th century technology that it enables us to transport data from continent to continent, building to building. Now, we passively rely on all of these infrastructures for the information and communication that we need to help us orientate ourselves within the world. But we're dangerously unaware of how all of this stuff works. We can't even see it. It's invisible. So that's where artists come in. So we're looking here at Dania Vasiliev and Julian Oliver. Um, they're artists, and in 2010, they became the men in grey. And that, guys, some years before Edward Snowden came along, they drew attention to the vulnerabilities of our technological systems. So as the men in grey, they carried these modified briefcases. Will someday permit a network user to log in. And, and the briefcases have on board hardware and software that can access open wireless networks. This hardware and software copies the seemingly private data which has been sent on these networks. And emails, images, um, private communication happening on social networks then appears on the briefcases screens. <laughs> <laughs> So private online conversations that we're having in chat rooms, or as this example here shows, direct messaging on Facebook, things that we think are private, are shown quite radically and disturbingly, you know, kind of in the public realm. So these vulnerabilities of online networks are made unsettlingly clear in this work. Um, this project here is, is making use of an established technique within computing called a man-in-the-middle attack, where data is intercepted en route between two computers. And here the artists are using their understanding of networks, cryptography, and the behavior of users online. And that's crucial for us, because these artists are coming from the network. They understand the network in a very, very deep way. And they help us, perhaps somewhat uncomfortably, develop an awareness of how trusting we are in these networks. So well before the PRISM revelations, um, as they described it, they are the lightning in the age of cloud computing. Their next project, Newsweek, took this idea a little bit further. Um, in this case, the artists build a physical device um, which manipulates the news, which is being read on wireless hotspots in places like cyber cafes or, um, you know, kind of different kinds of collective kind of internet meeting places. They designed a completely innocuous looking wall plug, which you can see there in the video, that seamlessly blends in with the local infrastructure, as you can see there. But what the wall plug has inside it is hardware and software that allows um, a user to remotely manipulate news stories on websites like the BBC or The Guardian without the reader of those news stories having any idea what's going on. So news becomes fictionalized, um, you know, kind of in the, in the environment of the wireless network. And what this project's trying to do is draw attention to the role that network infrastructure plays um, in the distribution of fact. We don't question these infrastructures in their relationship um, to the way that we gather information. And that criticality is something that these artists are really concerned about. 
In hindsight, projects like these can act, in a sense, as an early warning system for this post-PRISM landscape that we exist within now. They revealed how unquestionably we rely on networks and technological infrastructure and are largely ignorant of how easily manipulated they are. The artists took these concerns one step further and wrote what they call the Critical Engineering Manifesto. Since the world has become so imbued with technology that we now depend on machines, automation, and networks every single day, engineering, they conclude, must be the transformative language of our time. So as actors within this space, artists must take a critical approach to the language of engineering. If engineering defines the environment in which we live, we need to understand it. And an, an inability to describe technological infrastructure reduces our critical reach as people. It leaves us both disempowered and vulnerable. We become unable to describe our own environment. They believe that the objective isn't just to be able to describe the environment, but to actively take it on, to intervene into these hidden infrastructures, which are so critical to our lives. These artists made these important set of observations and this call to action before the Snowden revelations. And they weren't alone. The organization I work for, Lighthouse, has been actively surveying this murky landscape for some time. Firstly, in 2011, with an exhibition in Barcelona called Invisible Fields, which tried to reveal the radio spectrum, the invisible environment upon which most of our telecommunications technologies are based. We set out the spectrum as a physical space, invisible but present, able to be studied, mapped, surveyed, and explored. The show included artists like Joyce Hinting here, and semiconductor, whose work uses the radio waves which we harness um, to build our technological wireless world and reminds us that these radio waves occur in nature. It also included pieces by people like Timo Arnell, a designer and filmmaker who was at the heart of our most recent exhibition at Lighthouse in Materials. Their work is a collection of films, texts, and objects which make network technologies visible. The, um, the, the network of collaborations includes Timo himself, who's the artistic director at the design agency Berg. Um, he's also working with fellow designers, Ina Sneev Martensen, um, Jorn Knutsen, Matt Jones, and Jet Schultz. And what they've done is tried to create a visual language to reveal the technological systems that we rely on every day. Their work gives us tangible encounters with imperceptible technologies. And this is beautifully explored here in a piece called Immaterials Wi-Fi Painting, um, which visualizes the Wi-Fi technology that we rely on every day, but we have no visual understanding of. So I'll, I'll let that play for a second.
The invisibility explored in those beautiful works carries with it implicit philosophical dangers. As Timo has eloquently written, intentionally hiding technology, smoothing over the edges and the seams that make systems what they are, leads to a loss of understanding for both users and makers. And a loss of understanding means a loss of agency, of power. A lack of understanding also leads to all sorts of misconceptions and childish metaphors about what technology is. Remember that cloud survey. And as Timbo points out here, it clouds the critique around technology. This applies far more widely than in the sphere of design and technology, which is what Timo was referring to. That tendency that invisibility has to cloud critique is one of the central concerns of the artist Trevor Paglin. We showed his first UK solo show, Geographies of Seeing, last year at Lighthouse. And in it, Paglin was using the technologies of astronomical photography to expose hidden infrastructures of power. These infrastructures have now been made starkly visible by the existence of programs like PRISM and XKeyScore. But for years now, artists like Trevor Paglin have been in the front line of exposing the clandestine activities of global governments to the public. Paglin's first target was our night sky, does anyone want to have a guess about what the official catalogue says in terms of the number of objects which are in orbit right now? What do you reckon? 50k over here, anyone else want to guess? 20,000. 20,000 objects officially in orbit. But obviously what that, that official catalogue doesn't include are all the secret satellites um, which our militaries launch into space. So Paglin and his collaborators have tracked these secret satellites and they've photographed around 189 of them. To track the satellites, Paglin and his collaborators are using the same mathematics that Johannes Kepler used to describe the laws of planetary motion in the 17th century. This use of the basic techniques of the early Enlightenment to expose secret and largely invisible activities is entirely deliberate. As Paglin says, Galileo used the state-of-the-art technology of his time, the telescope, to observe that Jupiter had moons that were not meant to be there. Those moons meant that the established truth of the day, the Ptolemaic system, which held that the Earth was at the center of the universe, had to be wrong, overturned it. And this is radical because it meant that anyone, no matter who they were, could use a telescope and see the same thing. The democratizing potential of technology meant that truth could emerge from rational consensus. Paglin's interested now in how we can use those same tools and technologies, not to reveal unexpected moons orbiting around Jupiter, but man-made moons orbiting around our own planet are mapped by any official record. Because if we can't see them, we can't start asking why they're there. What are they doing? What are they looking at? And why is all this being kept from us? These are the questions which are fundamentally important to ask if you want to have political agency in this new technologized landscape we exist within. The well-known science fiction writer William Gibson has said in relation to new technologies that some of the most interesting applications appear first on the battlefield or in the gallery. Now, that might seem like an odd juxtaposition of our context, but this remark has been particularly salient for us as we've started to investigate another aspect of our post-prism world, drones. In recent times, I think we've all become aware that the unmanned aerial vehicle or drone has become one of the most potent weapons of contemporary warfare. Remotely controlled by operators thousands of miles from the theater of war, drones carry out aerial attacks, which often leave hundreds of people dead. 
They're one of the most controversial weapons of war, partly because of their ability to operate unseen and strike without warning. The artist and technologist James Bridal has created a series of projects that attempt to reveal the presence of drones in the landscape. For Dronestagram, James collected photographs of the locations of drone strikes and shared them on the photo service Instagram. The images of deserted barren landscapes and abandoned buildings have a sobering potency when juxtaposed with the things that we more normally see on Instagram, pets and parties. But it's what we don't see that gives these images their emotional power, the mortality. For his latest public intervention, which we commissioned for um, Brighton Festival earlier this year, a military drone made an airy incursion into the daily lives of Brighton residents. Under the shadow of the drone was an um, outdoor one-to-one -one drawing of exactly the kind of drone which is used by the UK and US military above the battlefields around the world. This is a Reaper drone. It made the drone visible on our streets. This stark marking out in an unexpected public place of the silhouette of a drone perhaps made people think about what it would mean to have a drone visit our own community. As James says, we all live under the shadow of the drone, although most of us are lucky enough not to be living under its direct fire. But for him, the drone can be seen as analogous with the network itself. It's an invisible, inherently connected technology allowing sight and action at a distance. And as he says, it's this very invisibility of network technologies which is the problem. Their true operation is masked. So this is a political issue. We need artists because they enable us to see the technological landscape for what it is, tangible, material, and made by us. They insist that we must not only be able to perceive it, we have to learn how to read it. They're giving us tools, tactics, and lenses to be able to perceive this post-prism landscape and act critically and ethically within it. These lenses are less likely to be like Google Glass and more likely to empower their users to critically perceive and act. So if you're looking for weak signals about what might be lurking just over the horizon, what might be the disruptive ideas of tomorrow, and where the sources of new hope might be in this post-prism landscape, then look to media artists, to critical engineers, and speculative designers. These are the people who are engaging with the dominant social, political, and environmental issues of our time. And in our post-prism landscape, they are, in their own words, the lightning and the age of cloud computing. Thank you. Um, just one final point. All of the references um, to that talk are on that URL, um, is good meaning talk. So, thank you. <laughs>